I always refer people to, to your stuff to get a good holistic view of what's going on. And so they can get a grasp of the contemporary situation right now. Cause I think most people just completely lack any grasp of, of any type of context of what's going on in the Middle East. And, and that's because no one really knows the, the history. Everyone's starting the story. I think last time I said, I think it's like a, um, it's like people tuning into season six of Game of Thrones, you know, when there's still five more seasons they need to watch and catch up on. <laughs> right, yeah. So it's, but that's, uh, I guess, what's uh, one of the goals with this podcast, uh, to educate people and, and uh, get them thinking the right way about U.S. foreign policy and, and, some of, and uh, explaining that some of our endeavors have been counterproductive, I guess would be the nicest way to say it. Yeah. And in, inexplicable because, you know, like you're left wondering why, <laughs> why did we do this? What was, we, you know, the, what was the gain? What was the angle? Yeah. Because we don't even really, if it's some nefarious plot from some evildoers, they're not doing a very good job. Exactly. This is, it ends up being not just destructive to the place we're attacking, but self-destructive to us. Yeah. yeah. So I guess, I guess there's certain people that profit and, you know, usually I kind of point the finger at place. I, I mean, there's a lot of fingers, there's a lot of people to be blamed, but I, I typically blame, uh, you know, companies like Lockheed Martin and Raytheon sure. and, and, you know, the, 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 the usual suspects, the, the usual suspects, but I know there's a lot more to it. Um, I guess a lot of people don't understand that a lot of our Middle Eastern policy is a consequence of a lot of our entanglements with the Soviet Union and, and the Cold War um, and just how exactly the Middle East was set up in the first place. And, and today I wanted to actually talk to you about, I wanted to start off the conversation by talking about Iran okay, and why, I think most people don't, don't know this, but the U.S. overthrew the Iranian democracy, I believe in 1953. Correct. Uh, or 19, 1953. And most people don't get, don't know that. And you now that's a very key piece of information that you're missing when you're uh, pointing the finger and throwing Iran in the axis of evil that we once overthrew them. So I, I, was, I was hoping that you could start off by explaining, you know, what, why did the United States overthrow the Iranian democracy? Okay, I think to do that though, I, I want to I want to actually back up before fifty three, and uh, start with what the British were doing at the end of the nineteenth century, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, in the eighteen nineties, uh, Britain found itself in a kind of an awkward place, and that was that its oil company Shell got purchased by Royal Dutch, and so even though the British had forty nine percent of Royal Dutch Shell which was good for them for profit-making purposes, it left them out of uh, the position of controlling the interests for that company. And the reason the British w became concerned about that was they believed, and obviously rightly so, I mean, they were clearly prescient, um, they believed that petroleum was going to replace coal, that, that coal was on its way out, and that the British Empire had to secure a source of oil um, that you know they could they could rely on even if there was a, a world war style war, and the British at this point hadn't fully dedicated themselves to the idea that they had to put Germany in its place, but were becoming concerned about Germany, and you know they were building their navy up to counterbalance the fact that the Germans were finally building a navy, and at that point they decided they had to create a new oil company to replace Shell. So they set off to do this. Um, the way we found oil at the time was you literally just walked along the ground and you hoped you stepped in it. And if you didn't step in it, you hoped you found black shale or black sandstone because that meant right there was oil underneath and it had been absorbed into that porous rock. Um, but the British realized the earth was just too big to do this, <laughs> to send out armies of people walking, looking for it. So they did something really unusual, and that was they read history books with the specific goal of finding references to oil, especially um, medieval sources, right? Because if it was ancient, it might be too old, but medieval. And what they realized was that 
the Arabs were, were pumping oil through pipes underneath their streets a thousand years ago into oil lamps and they lit up their, their towns. So they knew there must be a large and reasonable oil source, reasonable, easy to access oil source somewhere in the Middle East. Um, in 1900, the British basically helped uh, a group of tribesmen in the Ottoman Empire stage a rebellion in Kuwait and then invaded Kuwait to secure it, to, to secure it, <laughs> right, um, and carved it out of the Ottoman Empire. And that would become their base of operations for their oil exploration endeavors. The very next year, the British set up a deal with the uh, Qajars. The Qajars were the rulers of Persia, because it hadn't yet changed its name to Iran. Um, they were opium addicts. And the deal that the British set up was that they would get a 95% concession, which is, of course, outrageous. Uh, you would expect there to be like a 50% concession since it's Iranian oil, but the British are doing the work of getting it out of the ground. Um, but they got a 95% concession. And one of the reasons was almost certainly because as the world's first great drug dealer empire, the British empire had basically a monopoly on opium and just leveraged that against the Qajars. Um, they, they end up creating the Anglo-Persian oil company and lo and behold, two years later, in 1903, they find oil in Khuzestan, which is the southwest corner of Iran. And the British are, you know, <laughs> pumping it out. And they're, they're thrilled because they've got this 95% concession. But then two years later, um, England has some seriously bad luck. In 1905, Persia decides to go democratic. And the British realize that any democratic government is going to vote, they're gonna elect to undo that 95% concession. There's no way they're gonna leave that in place. And so the British realize that the only way they're gonna be able to keep something like that, because it's just too outrageous, is they're gonna to have to overthrow Iran's democracy. So they begin work talking to the Russians. And of course the Russians are in the middle of the, um, Russo-Japanese war getting their butts kicked in this humiliating route and that that's going to actually lead to uh, a, a little uh, a precursor to the 1917 revolution in 1906 but in 1905 when the British are talking to the Russians the Russians are looking for an easy victory so they can kind of help boost morale and they conclude that they're going to help the British they invade Iran from the north the British invade from the south um, and the British, what they do is they pump money into the hands of the clerics and they get the religious groups in Iran with the support of the Russian and British armies to overthrow the democracy. So in 1906, Iran's fledgling democracy is put down. Interestingly enough, that means that Iran gets to get rid of the Qajars. They end up with Reza Shah. He decides to implement a... Um, a modernization program, but it, it's pretty clear that if he tries to do anything to the oil concession, he's going to get punked just like the democracy does did, and so he leaves that alone. He's, he stays away from that. So then, fa uh, fast forward, and World War II has ended. It's Iran actually was occupied during World War II by the British and the Russians again, so it gets it gets invaded twice by this. Russo-British team. Um, the official excuse is um, that because the Germans had occupied Norway, it wasn't safe for the Brits to, to send uh, material to Russia through the Arctic Circle or through the Baltic Sea. So the only way for them to do it safely was to go around Africa and then up through, um, through Iran. And so, anyway, the, the, when the war ends, the British withdraw, and then the Russians hesitate to, to completely withdraw because their goal was actually briefly to, to take Azerbaijan. Uh, Iran owned about 60% of Azerbaijan, and then Azerbaijan was a Soviet a socialist republic inside the Soviet Union, and they, they, were, they said they wanted to unify. We, the United States, actually, we threatened to nuke Russia if they didn't withdraw from Iran 
Um, that may be the first country we ever threatened to nuke for something. Uh, we, we did it probably a dozen times, if not more. Um, the Russians go, okay, okay, <laughs> and they withdraw. And then in 1950, Iran decides to do a second attempt at democracy. Um, they elect Prime Minister Mossadegh. Mossadegh decides that one of his top priorities is to, in fact, uh, get rid of the 95% concession deal. By this time, it, the Anglo-Persian oil company is renamed the Anglo-Iranian oil company. Um, so he decides the first thing he has to do is throw the British embassy staff out, right? Because that's where the spies are. And so he throws the British embassy staff out and, uh, and then he goes and he seizes the assets for the Anglo-Iranian oil company and he renames it the National Iranian Oil Company. And he doesn't just get rid of the 95% concession, he gets rid of the Brits entirely. And of course, this sends the British into hysteria they want to overthrow the government, but they can't because their spy cadre has been thrown out of the country when the embassy was closed. And so in 1950, the British are basically left holding the bag. Again, they have no oil company. It, you know, it's not technically true because uh, the Anglo-Iranian oil company had assets elsewhere. Um, but, it, but it is essentially true, right? Because they lost their main, their main source of oil at that point. The only thing that they had left really was their Iraq assets, which they had taken in the aftermath of World War I. Um, so the British are scrambling. They actually came to us. They came to the United States and they asked Harry S. Truman if he would overthrow the Iranian democracy in their name. Um, he had experience doing this. The fledgling CIA uh, in 1949 decided that it would sort of test itself, see what it could do. Uh, Miles Copeland was the CIA guy in, in Syria. He actually staged a CIA-led coup in Syria and overthrew Syria's fledgling democracy. So Truman certainly had the experience. He had done it before. It wasn't completely alien to him, the idea of doing it. Uh, but he says, no. He says, no, we're not going to do that for you. In 1952, so just two years later, when Eisenhower is running for president, the British come to him and they said, when you win, right, not if, when, when you win, uh, will you do this for us? And Eisenhower is quick to say yes. And Eisenhower is barely president. He orders the CIA to go ahead and do the coup in Iran. Uh, the operative at the time in Iran was a guy named Kermit Roosevelt. And of course, Kermit Roosevelt was Theodore Roosevelt's grandson. <laughs> Um, like all good feudal societies, you want to keep things going from generation to generation. Um, so Kermit Roosevelt decides to kind of take a straight approach to it. He goes and he finds members of the Iranian military who are eager to get rid of Mossadegh that can be manipulated. Um, he convinces them that what they should just do is walk up to his door one night and arrest them, or arrest Mossadegh. So uh, that's exactly what they do. They, you know, it's that, that 3 a.m. knock late at night, catch the guy in his pajamas. They knock on the door. Mossadegh comes to the door and the military says, uh, you're under arrest. We're, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a coup. And Mossadegh goes, no, no, you're under arrest. And, and they're baffled. They're like, wait, what do you mean we're under arrest? We're here to arrest you. And out from behind the bushes, step most of that loyalist and they they end up arresting the coup leaders and kermit roosevelt was actually watching but he was off in the distance <laughs> and he sees what happens and he's like running through the streets of tehran trying to get away um and he and he does he gets away and he goes into hiding at that point eisenhower panics eisenhower realizes this is this could turn ugly right this could turn into an international incident and so Eisenhower um, calls it off. He says, come you know, end the operation. We don't, we don't need to overthrow Iran. Um, Roosevelt decides that, no, he's going to do it anyway. And he goes and he meets with Norman Schwarzkopf Sr., uh, 
the general's dad. Storm and Norman. George Kopp, Senior was, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Storm, Storm and Norman. Norman. Uh, senior was, in fact, a businessman who had dealings throughout the Middle East and, and um, could probably be described as a lover of the Middle East. Um, he, he certainly understood the culture. He's, he knew a lot of the background. Interestingly enough, uh, you could probably describe Roosevelt that way. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. Like Here's this guy who clearly has a lot of love for the Middle East, but at the end of the day, his nationalistic attitude trumps any loyalty he had there. Um, so he goes to, Roosevelt goes to um, Schwarzkopf Sr. and says, help, what, what should I do? And they come up with a brilliant plan. What Roosevelt's going to do is he's basically going to take bags of CIA money. He's going to go to the, the corner of the streets where all the day workers are and hire them. And then he's going to have them hold up signs saying, we support Mossadegh, we support the government, you know, we want more democracy. And then have them march up and down the streets and then end their protest by attacking businesses and breaking things and, and attacking property. And so this starts to happen. And everyone's baffled. Like Mossadegh's like, why would, we're in charge. I'm the prime minister. You don't need to do this. Things are going well. Stop. And they, you know, they keep doing it, and he keeps telling people, "Stop! Don't protest like this. We don't need to protest like this." And eventually, what happens is it turns the public opinion and the army's opinion against Mossadegh, and eventually uh, the military steps in and they do they they put him under house arrest and overthrow his government. And so, in a nutshell, uh, we do what really, when you think about it, is a precursor to Chechenization. It's this. We flip the thing upside down. We make it look like it's that the, the supporters of the guy we want out of power are these thugs running around smashing things when in reality that was just to us. <laughs> and the, the guys that we were against were actually not necessarily acting badly. No, that was just the CIA. That was just CIA. Just the CIA doing that. <laughs> yeah. what, I, what I find funny is that Truman said no at first where he's like, no, but the U.S. doesn't do that sort of thing. Overthrow yeah, democracy. exactly. That's his attitude. Like Even he, though he had just done it the year before in Syria. Yeah, he, he had just been literally doing it. And then uh, why do you think Eisenhower was so, was so willing to help out the British? So that's, that's the question of questions. So the myth about Eisenhower, the thing that we're always sort of propagating and, and talking about, is that when he was Supreme Allied Commander in World War II, you know, because technically he was in charge of even the British forces. Um, he grew to love the Brits, and the, there was this symbiotic relationship established, and he was just loyal to the Brits. And, and I think the reason we, a lot of us bl believed or believe that was because he pushed that, that narrative. But in reality, I think there was actually something way, way more interesting going on. If you look at his policies, like the things that he systematically does for his eight years as president, he regularly undermined the British and the French um, to the point where he gave them humiliating defeats. Like in 1956, when the British, the French, and the Israelis attack Egypt, he sides with Egypt against the British, the French, and the Israelis. And he actually manages to get the Security Council, I don't know how still, I, I need to figure this out, but he manages to convince the UN to send in soldiers to Egypt that will actually end up fighting the British and the French if they don't pull out. And, um, you know, they pull out, so they don't have that fight. But just the fact that that happens turns the 1956 Suez Canal War into this epic route for the British and French politically. Um, and that's, that's the Eisenhower's style. He supports the communists in Iraq in 58. Um, you know, he, he's supporting the French, Re the, sorry, the Algerian revolutionaries against the French in the 50s. Uh, you know, he's, he's regularly on the other side of the British and the French. So I think his real motive in Iran was to pretend like he was helping Britain do the coup and then muscle the United States into Iran's oil fields. Um, the, the British actually ultimately 
they're not thrown out of Iran. Like they do get to come back. They, they were thrown out by Iran, but they do get to come back after the coup, but not the same way. They're going to be a minor partner. It's Iran becomes effectively a U.S. colony as opposed to a British colony. It was never a colony, but the, the sphere of influence flips from British to U.S. And uh, the... So what I really think he did was he, he saw an opportunity to get Exxon in there. I think he saw an opportunity to get U.S. oil companies in there so he could pretend like he was helping the British but screw them at the same time. And yeah, and that's he, what want too. Yeah, and the Eisenhower doctrine was to get the British and the French out of the Middle East. Yeah, I, the, I think it was even broader than that. I, the Eisenhower doctrine, I think, was really literally to destroy the British and French empires and then replace them with the U.S. empire. And I, and I think his goal, that was his priority. And then after that was to keep the Middle East divided against itself. And then maybe then fight communism, which was, you know, in contrast to Truman, because his goal was we have to fight communism by all means and that's available to us. So after, so after they overthrow Mossadegh, um, how did they, they, did they implement the Shah right away? Or is there like a grace period? Like how, how did that work? Okay, so what happened actually is the British are the guys who put the Shah in power uh, when they invaded in World War II. What, what happened was the Brits go to the Shah and they go, we want you in charge. And, you know, the Shah is baffled. He's like, well, my dad, my dad is in charge. And they go, yeah, yeah, we'll put your dad under house arrest and put you in charge. And the Shah was uh, such a duplicitous bastard <laughs> that he actually punks his own dad and works with the British and the Russians. Um, so the British see him as a guy they can work with. And then in 1953, when we punk Mossadegh, basically we then prop the shop in his place. And uh, we realize we can work with him. You know, the, the British liked him, but we, we realized that he was our man. And he will tyrannize Iran for a quarter century afterwards. Um, you know, he has these grandiose visions for modernization um, for, the, for the Iranian culture, the Iranian nation. Um, but at the end of the day, he's really just a two-bit tyrant. He, he, he does modernize Iran a little bit. Um, he, he does these really kind of grotesque things where he tries to bring back ancient Iranian culture. He sort of pushes back against uh, contemporary Iranian culture and, you know, spends exorbitant amounts of money on these on these uh celebrations of iran's ancient past and there were poor iranians wondering hey, what are you doing spending money on something that happened 25 centuries ago um but then also you couldn't oppose him politically he was going to put you in prison if he did yeah and and iran at that time was called little america right R little america also sometimes called the shopping mall of the middle east uh, I, I'm pretty sure bleach was one of the number one chemicals that Iranians bought because everybody had blonde hair and nose jobs because they all wanted to look like Americans. That sounds like such an insult to say to the Persian Empire now calling it the shopping mall of the Middle East. Because when you say <laughs> the shopping mall somewhere, it, it sounds like a place that's just kind of like really really commercialized and cultureless, and now you're calling the Persians the shopping mall. I can see yeah. how that can definitely inspire a, maybe a little self-hatred. And, and yeah. what, so I understand that there's two, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's two factions that were against the Shah, which eventually led up to the revolution. It was a communist faction as well as a religious faction. Is that correct? So that's a good way to, to look at it. It is a little bit more complicated in that, in that there were multiple communist groups and there were multiple religious groups. Um, and there were also socialists, just to make it a little bit more complicated. Um, but but um, the, you know, the communists end up in a really powerful position, and then the, the Islamists also end up in a really powerful position. So as the revolution is unfolding, it really largely is communists and Islamists working together against the Shah. Um, and, and when things started to look really bad, did the U.S. support one faction or the other? So, you know, <laughs> 
at the, the U.S. is not averse to supporting communists during a revolution. Um, we, we did that in 58 in Iraq, for example. The, the danger for us, though, was that if Iran went communist, it would then go to the Soviet bloc. And that would, solve, that would have solved a lot of problems for the Soviet Union if Iran had become an ally. The Soviet Union had been playing, you know, pretty hard trying to get into the Middle East. Um, they, had, they had kind of succeeded with um, Egypt but we, and, and Syria, but we had successfully pulled Egypt away in the aftermath of the 1967 and 73 Arab-Israeli wars. So the Soviet Union had lost Egypt, which was his best. It wasn't a, an ally in the strongest sense. Like Egypt wasn't loyal to the Soviet Union by any means, but Egypt was willing to work with the Soviet Union. Um, so the Soviets could kind of replace Egypt if they could get a hold of Iran. But Iran was even better to the, for the Soviets than that. Oil rich, Egypt definitely wasn't oil rich. So it would become a, a supply of at least cheap oil. Not that the Soviets didn't have any, but you know, right? it's not going to hurt any to have extra. But also, Iran had a decent port on the Persian Gulf, at the point really where the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea are. And so it would have allowed the Soviets to trade directly with the Indian Ocean by going through Iran, something that they dreamt of. And so we desperately didn't want Iran to go communist. Um, it, we realized that if Iran went Islamist, because the communists were atheists, Iran would have a difficult time allying directly with the Soviet Union because the, their religious rhetoric would then clash with the Soviet Union's communist rhetoric. Um, so our thinking was, if we can't have Iran, we have to at least make sure the Soviets can't. Um, just as an example of the, the kind of things we did, the Ayatollah Khomeini had been in France, but then the French uh, asked him to leave. He went to Iraq. Saddam Hussein actually had him. And the U.S. basically told Saddam Hussein, we'd like you to release him into Iran so that, you know, he can go lead the Islamist faction. And that's exactly what happens. And, you know, next thing you know, the Islamists defeat the communists, um, which, by the way, worked out really badly for the communists. Uh, the Islamists eventually don't just defeat them and then take over. They actually turn on them and begin killing them. Um, and the com most of the communists fled. Many of them ended up in the United States, interestingly enough. So was, was Khomeini, was he in jail in Iraq? Was he, was he imprisoned? Uh, no, I, I, I'm pretty sure he wasn't. I think he was simply just uh, staying in Iraq. He couldn't go to Iran because, right, the Shah was going to arrest him. Um, but then once he was in Iraq, Saddam Hussein could, could determine what happened to him in terms of movement. So whether or not he went to Iran or not was sort of up to him. And the U.S. told him, yeah, we'd like to, we'd like to see that guy go into Iran. So Saddam Hussein obliged. Because at the time, of course, he was, to put it in Donald Rumsfeld's terms, a very good ally of the United States. A very, a very good ally, indeed. So, he, um, so they, they imported Khamenei into Iran to recover from losing their best ally in the Middle East. Yeah, you know, we loved Iran so much. I, I still don't know why this happened. We, we actually gave them a, a copy of our mint plates for, for, for printing money. I, I, I'm not, I think this is right, but you know, you'll probably need to double check this. I believe it was so that we could, the CIA could mint money in Iran directly to fund its own operations. Um, in any case, that's a bizarre thing to do to give a foreign power <laughs> the ability to print money or at least put, locate, a facility in a foreign country to, to make money. Another weird thing is we actually sold uh, Iran the, the F-14 Tomcat. That was the only country on earth besides the United States that had the F-14 Tomcat. Great Britain didn't even have that airplane. Like, you know, like, wow. Um, I think we believe that Iran would, would forever be a U.S. ally. To make things even stranger, it was our headquarters for all CIA oper operations in Asia which is, again, probably why we had the, the mint plates there. Um, so we literally put all our eggs in one basket, and then, and then the basket got smashed. But that was our own doing, right? I mean, if we, hadn't, and if we hadn't given all that power to the Shah, and he wasn't such a dirty tyrant, 
Iran probably wouldn't have turned on us so so hard. Um, so yeah, you know, <laughs> it's just a weird situation. It's like trusting a friend so much that you give them your debit card and your pin number. Right. But, but in the meantime, you're like sleeping with the friend's girlfriend and beating him regularly. And then he turns on you and you're like, why? I don't understand. <laughs> so something that I heard, I, I think I've read this somewhere. I can't forget the exact source, but Hezbollah had, they, Hezbollah got a hold of the printing press and they're able to print like $20 bills. Yes. So what happened was he- Hezbollah was actually born in Iran. Um, but uh, during the revolution, it just means party of God. Um, what happened was Iran didn't want them. <laughs> One of the things that all revolutionary governments after a revolution don't want are revolutionaries because revolutionaries tend to be idealistic. And when, when they see the reality of the post-revolution, they tend to turn on those governments. So Iran got this great idea, and that was to export them and get them to go somewhere else. And the, the somewhere else happened to be Lebanon. And the reason why Iran thought that would be a great idea, of course, was because Lebanon desperately needed something, something to push back against Israel. And um, Hezbollah goes to Israel, I'm sorry, goes to Lebanon, and then Iran goes, oh, by the way, we don't know what to do with these, and basically hands them those plates. And Hezbollah begins printing $20 bills, and that's how they funded their operations in the early years. It's why we had to change our money. So, you know, like if you're, if, if, if you find bills from 25 years ago, they don't look like the bills we have today. It's, it's because of that. That's, um, that's just so, it's so, I don't want to say it's funny, but it's just so ironic. You can't not, you can't not just look at the humor in that. Yeah, I agree. So, so what led to the eventual, um, invasion or attack on the u.s embassy from those iranian students okay so that's that's a great question because i think a lot of americans are really confused about this so um after the revolution after the shah has fled the country he uh he went to egypt for medical treatment uh he ends up in panama it's it's a mess right the revolution has taken place um it's not enough for a group of Iranian students, college students, that the United States is out of Iran. That, that they, they want more. And what they want is they want an apology for 1953. They also want to prove what happened in 1953. Everybody knew it was the CIA, but what they needed was a document that's that in the CIA's writing that showed that the CIA had really done this. Well, what an embassy is, is it's the headquarters for your spies. And it turned out that the Iranian, the U.S. embassy in Iran was the headquarters for the CIA for the whole of Asia. But the students didn't know that. They just knew that that's where the CIA was. By the time the students began marching on the embassy, the embassy was a skeleton staff of basically just CIA operatives. It was about 50 CIA guys because you know all the official staff had left all the families were gone the secretaries all the support staff they were all gone the reason those 50 guys were still there is they were shredding the documents they were they were liquidating the the embassy's you know guilty proof and so the students storm the walls and capture the embassy because they want those documents that those cia operatives are shredding um, strangely enough, the students don't lose heart when they see the documents shredded. They grab the shreddings and they stuff them in garbage bags and they go to nearby schools and they, they go up to the kids and they dump out the shredded documents and they go, you guys like to make puzzles, don't you? And they employ children and the children put the shredded documents back together. So it, it did, the shredding was a, a big waste of time because the documents get put back together. And then what the Iranians do is they photocopy them. They make them completely available to the whole world. The real reason they would do this is because they're trying to prove to the rest of the world that the CIA had overthrown their, their government in 53 and the documents detail out exactly what Kermit Roosevelt did. But just to add the twist, it also says the location and alias of 
all these CIA operatives in Indochina, in India, in, in China, like it's a catastrophe for the CIA because now their operatives in the field are, are exposed and, you know, the CIA is pulling them out as fast as they can. Um, and it, so it's a devastating event for, the, for CIA operations in Asia. Well, at that point, the students tell the United States we're we're ready to let these the CIA guys that we captured go. We just need an apology. So when the students were marching towards the embassy, the Iranian government told the embassy, "Get out, do whatever you have to get out of there," because they didn't want them captured because that's an international incident. So the the um, the Iranian government actually ended up in these negotiations with the students, trying to get them to let the CIA operatives go. But the students go, yeah, we're happy to let them go. We don't really want them. What we want is an apology from the United States. And of course, Carter was never going to issue that apology. And so the students go, well, we're never going to free these hostages. And so that's why the hostage situation came into being. It's, um, it just sounds like a very, very messy breakup. It was, it was a, a very, very messy nasty breakup. breakup. Like, let's just say if somebody... If somebody cheats on you, then you like take the proof of them cheating on you and like leak it on the internet. It sounds like the equivalent of that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. A, a, and a, except a, that it also showed that there had been a history of cheating elsewhere too. <laughs> yeah. It, it it just was a total smash on their reputation as well. Right. So something I wanted to also get into was the I guess the start of the U.S. relationship with Saddam Hussein. Now, Saddam, obviously, I think the CIA, from my understanding, the CIA was in contact with, with Saddam Hussein before he became president. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? Like, when did that covert relationship begin? Because they, I mean, Saddam helped import um, Ayatollah Khamenei into the country. So when exactly did that relationship start with Iraq? It probably actually, the CIA-Saddam Hussein relationship probably started in the, in the 60s. Um, the, the, so in 1958, um, a revolution was brewing in Iraq and there were two major factions, the communists and the socialists. And the socialists were the, by far the largest. Um, the socialist goal was to take Iraq out of the British empire and then unify it with Egypt and Syria, which had just unified. The communist goal was to take Iraq out of the British Empire and then add it to the Soviet bloc and keep Iraq independent from Syria and Egypt. Well, the United States wanted the first part of both goals. They, they, they were both parties' goals. They wanted Iraq out of the British Empire so that it could now become part of the U.S. sphere of influence. So the U.S. was happy either, either side. The problem was if Iraq turned around and joined Syria and Egypt, it would mean that Iraq wasn't part of the U.S.'s sphere of influence because Egypt and Syria's unification, that goal was to make a new world power, which would be the Arab world. And we desperately didn't want that to happen. So Eisenhower began funding the communists, hoping that even though there was a possibility Iraq would end up in the Soviet sphere, at least it would be easier to get it away from the Soviet sphere than it would be to get it away from a, a unification event with Syria and Egypt. Um, in the end, the socialists won the revolution, but they had to compromise with the communists because the communists were just powerful enough. And so the compromise was that Iraq would only symbolically join Egypt and Syria, it wouldn't in reality join. They ended up with a guy named Abdel Karim Ghassam as their, as their first uh, head of state and uh, stayed out of the United Arab Republic, didn't join the Soviet bloc. It was about the best result the United States could have expected to hap have happen, right? Done with the British, didn't join the Soviet bloc and not part of the United Arab Republic. Once Iraq seemed like it was clear it wasn't gonna go in one of those three directions, um, in 1963, the CIA went and assassinated Gossel. Um, so what that does is that plunges Iraq into psychotic chaos. It has coup after coup. Governments are toppling here and there. And briefly, if I remember correctly, it's 1968. Double check that year. 
um, the Ba'athists in, in Iraq managed to gain power. And Saddam Hussein had already joined the, that party. And so briefly, he was actually part of the government in Iraq. And he was um, basically a thug for the party. He would actually commit crimes to generate capital uh, to help fund the party's activities. So we liked him, and we were probably already well connected with him. So that in 76, when the Ba'athists take, take Iraq over again, uh, we began immediately communicating with him to, sign, to see if we can work with him. And, uh, uh, and we find out we can, because we give him a list of people we don't like in Iraq. We don't, we don't tell him what we want to have him do with those people. We just tell him, well, you know, we don't like these guys. They're, um, a lot of them are scholars. A lot of them are activists. A lot of them just belong to political parties that we're not really keen on, like socialists. And uh, he has the mass arrested. They do these big kangaroo courtroom hearings where they're trying 20, 50 defendants at a time. They're all found guilty. And then he has a mass hanged uh, live and primetime TV across the country. I'm just imagining some CIA guy just going like, hmm, how about that? Yeah, okay, that we can work with that guy. <laughs> how about that? How about that? It's about the best possible result imaginable. Um, he effectively is running Iraq by that point because the president himself was sick and not n no longer functioning. When the president dies, Saddam Hussein is in charge. And we've got this well-established relationship with with him um and then we're going to leverage that against iran and trigger the iran iraq war so he was very so, useful to us yeah if so from my understanding of of uh how the war began was that southern the oil rich parts of iran were arab Hosekstan was mainly arab and the u.s now, I'm not 100% sure about this, so I'm hoping you can help me clear, to clear this up and get a better understanding. So did the U.S. encourage Saddam Hussein to, to invade Iran? Yes. Or was that something like that was just a mutual, you know, did he ask for the okay? And like, hey, listen, I, there's a bunch of Arabs here. We would love the oil. And the U.S. said, well, why not? It's going to help us out. And we're getting over a bitter breakup with Iran. So what, what exactly happened there? I, I really think it was a vengeance event that we went to the Iraqis and we said, Iran's military is in ruins. Now's the time to attack. So yeah, Khuzestan is majority Arab. It's also where Iraq, Iran's oil s supply is. Um, so what Saddam Hussein could do is he could say, my goal is to take Khuzestan, since it's ethnically Arab, out of this Persian dominated state and then he'd effectively wipe out Iran's oil reserves. Um, during, you know, the whole reason for our interest in Iran was oil. So this was like a double win for us. We could cripple Iran and, that, and get vengeance for them breaking up with us. And then we could move that oil from Iran to Iraq, which would then allow us to send in Exxon or, or Mobile or whatever company we wanted down the ground there to get at that oil. So we would win big if, if Saddam Hussein could pull it off. So in 1981, the Iraqis attacked. Now, it turned out that, yes, in fact, U.S. intel was correct that um, the Iranians had decapitated their military quite literally, like they, they were executing their generals. Um, the Air Force generals escaped. They jumped on airplanes and flew away. Some of the, some of the admirals escaped, but most of the generals, the army generals were caught and they were executed. Um, and, you know, the Iranians did like you would do after a, a revolution and they purged whole sectors of the Iranian officer corps. So that part of U.S. intel was correct. Um, but you have to remember that Iran is three times the size of Iraq in, in population. So Iraq attacking a crippled Iran or a weakened, I shouldn't even say crippled, a weakened Iran is still a complicated proposition, right? Because the Iranians just outnumber the Iraqis by so much. Um, Saddam Hussein's goal was uh, the city of Abadan, which uh, is right on the border with Iraq. 
Um, it, had, it had at one point the world's largest oil refinery. Um, the irony of ironies is Abaddon in Arabic means never. <laughs> and so he's trying to capture never. Uh, he sends in his forces to the north. They're trying to flank around the city and cut it off. And they, they never do. They never, they never even enter the city. They do, they do bomb it, um, but they never manage to get tanks or infantry into the city. Um, the Iranian military manages to hold the Iraqis in place and then actually push back their uh, salient right up to the border. And what ends up happening, instead of Saddam Hussein capturing Khuzestan and pulling it out of Iran, instead of that happening, what ends up happening is a World War I style trench war where neither side manages to move the border very much uh, for eight cruel, bloody, sadistic years. And that's where Iraq was using all those chemical weapons, right? They were, they were, it, it's, that war is defined by the, the brutalness and the use of terrible chemical weapons. Is that correct? It, it is like World War I in that way also, yes. Uh, Iraq used sarin gas, ner uh, VX gas, uh, nerve gas, mustard gas, and um, we were actually their number one supplier, of course. Um, the Iranians never used gas weapons during the entire eight-year period. Having said that, when Halabja got gassed, the, the Kurdish village in the north, that uh, George Bush Sr. made so much hay over because he kept saying that Saddam Hussein had gassed his own people. When, when the village got gassed, what had happened was U.S. satellite photos had shown that the Iranians had actually moved in and occupied the village during the day. Um, so what the Iraqis did was they flew in helicopters during the night and then dropped gas on the village to kill the Iranian soldiers that were there. But what they didn't know, what the satellite photos didn't show, was that during the night, Kurds had moved back in after the Iranian military had pulled out during the night. So instead of gassing the Iranians, he, the Iraqis accidentally gassed the Kurds. Well, uh, President Reagan had actually dispatched Gene Kirkpatrick to Iraq to figure out how they could spin it so that they could blame Iran for doing it. And she came away saying that Iran had gassed the Kurds in Halabja that not, and, and did not blame Iraq. She had blamed Iran, even though there was absolutely no evidence ever that Iran gassed anybody during the entire eight years of the war. And, and the war eventually ends when the U.S. shot down an Iranian airliner, right? That's what, <laughs> uh, that, that's what uh, defeated Iran, like that. <laughs> I know, I know you well enough already that I know you're setting that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, we shoot down a, an Airbus flying from Iran to Oman, and we, uh, short, right around the same time period, Iran declares that they want to end the war. And so we pretend that shooting down an Airbus full of civilians, killing, I don't know what the number was, 200 plus people, um, that, that somehow that triggered Iran to end the war because it had just gone, it was just one too many deaths. Uh, that is wrong. <laughs> we did not end the war for Iran by killing those people. We'd actually been attacking Iran rather aggressively throughout the war to the point where um, when the oil facilities in Abadan were bombed by the Iraqis and destroyed, Iran decided to rebuild a brand new oil refinery. And uh, they, they went up to the island, Kharga, and they began building um, a new, this massive brand new oil refinery. We actually pulled up with our fleet, with our Navy, and we bombed Iran's oil facility. I'm still trying to figure out how that wasn't uh, enough of an act of war that it could have gotten widespread condemnation from the planet. But it, you know, other than a little whimper, nobody really protested. Um, we were doing attacks like that against Iran during the the war. We were, we were also supplying Iraq with weapons. Technically, we were supplying Iran with spare parts, but at four times market value. But we were supplying Iraq with uh, weapons, you know, retail, of course. In any case, um, what it, the real reason why the war ended, there was, a, there was sort of a 
a, a duality to it. First of all, Saddam Hussein really early on began begging the Iranians to end the war. Um, he said, look, I've made a mistake. You guys were not weak. Uh, I was misled. I know I'm on the wrong, but we really need to end this war. All it's doing is getting both of our countries slaughtered. Iran, I think, believed that Iraq was conquerable. And I, and I, and I think uh, Ayatollah Khomeini began to think that maybe if Iraq collapsed, he could create a new giant Islamic state that he would capture Iraq and then, you know, there was no reason to stop there. And so I think the Iranians, even though they were the ones attacked, sort of became the aggressor in the war, at least briefly. Um, eventually, though, they, you know, the Iran managed to capture Iraq's major port, Fowl, um, that forced Iraq to build a secondary supplemental port facility behind it. Um, you know, so Iran, Iran managed to do some hurtful things to Iraq. But at the end of the day, Iran never had the kind of equipment Iraq had. Iranian soldiers went into battle without enough boots, without enough jackets, without enough rifles. Um, they were literally, it was like, you know, if, if you know anything about the Battle of Stalingrad with the Soviet Union, they were literally told, follow that guy when he dies, takes his boot, take his boots, jacket, and rifle. And that's a, that's a terrible way to fight a war. Um, the Iraqis, even though they were outnumbered three to one, were had a kill ratio of three to one. So, you know, that's, that's about what stalemate and disaster looks like. And I think the Iranians just were reaching a point where they didn't have the stomach to, to hold out uh, for, for an offensive outcome, for a conquest of Iraq. In addition, Iraq began firing Scud missiles into Tehran. And even though the Scud missiles weren't effective as a military uh, weapon, they, they were a great weapon of terror. Um, I would imagine that the majority of people who lived in Tehran during that period probably have PTSD today. Uh, you know, it was the equivalent of the, the V1 and the V2 rockets going into London during World War II. And that had a pretty traumatic effect on the population. And then uh, Ayatollah Khomeini died. And I think once that happened, that opened the door then for the possibility of, of having a, a, a peaceful resolution. And basically the, the resolution was uh, to admit that neither side had won and leave the borders where they were essentially. There was actually some adjustment to the border, but it was minor, insignificant stuff. And um, the low number is that a million people died about a quarter of a million Iraqis and about three quarters of a million Iranians. Uh, the high number is that it was two million, that the numbers were double. Um, so the truth is probably in there somewhere. And nothing was gained. It was just eight wasted years. I always find it really weird that people don't talk about that war. Like I never, I never learned what the Iranian and Iraq war was until probably, until I was out of college probably. Um, I've heard about it, but I never like, no one ever told me the total amount of chaos that took place until I was much older. So I imagine that a lot of people have never actually heard of the Iranian Iraq war and how absolutely brutal it was. Like, it was like, like you said, it was like world war one, but just in the middle East in the Gulf. Right. Just between two states. <laughs> yeah. So what, what were the, so what were the, yeah. after the war, both, both countries are in ruin. Um, what were the steps that they took to recover their economies and their societies? So, um, Iran and Iraq, first of all, one of, there, there were some positive outcomes. So the war itself was obviously not a good idea, but one of the positive outcomes that came from it was because so many men had died on both sides, um, it really opened the doors for women to move into professions that they had been mostly locked out of. So, you know, if we think about like Rosie the Riveter, <laughs> World War II, that, that effect had taken place. Um, in the case of Iraq, that liberalization of roles, gender roles, uh, had even taken place on a political level. 17% of Iraq's parliament was made up of women. Um, women had moved into university positions, women had become MDs, there were women engineers. You know, there was, there was this, period where Iraq's economy 
looked more like a little bit more like a European economy. Um, the problem Iraq was having in the aftermath of the war was it had a lot of debt. It had to pay for all that sarin and VX gas and all that mustard gas. So, um, and then, you know, it was buying F-15s from us. Those aren't cheap. And it was buying Exocet missiles from the French and Mirages from the French. So Iraq and Iran, which also had a huge amount of debt, went to OPEC and they said, is there any way you can increase our share of the oil market? And so what the rest of the OPEC members agreed to was they were going to do cuts, production cuts, and then Iraq and Iran were going to do production increases to offset the production cuts. That way the price of oil globally wasn't affected. It just would mean a larger share of the oil market for Iran and Iraq. And I don't remember how many years they were going to do this for, but they were going to do it for a few years so that Iran and Iraq would have a bunch of capital so they could pay down their debt. Um, and so actually, you know, if that had happened, if, if the oil, if the share of the market had been increased for Iran and Iraq, it would have left Iran and Iraq in a really nice place financially for the 90s. But um, I guess other things happen though, and, and a lot of it in, in Kuwait. Yes. They started flooding the market with oil, is that correct? So the, mark, the price of oil doesn't stay stable. It actually plunges, which means somebody's cheating. It means somebody is, is selling more oil than they had agreed to. So it doesn't take very long for Iraq to realize it's Kuwait. Of all countries, itty bitty little Kuwait, that place the British carved out in 1900 so they could look for oil in the Middle East and have a, a base of operations, basically. That place starts flooding the oil markets. So the price globally is going down. So even though Iran and Iraq technically have a larger share, they're not really making any extra money because they're making less per barrel. So Iraq uh, sends a communique to Kuwait asking them to back down and, and, and comply with the the agreement that they had agreed to at OPEC, at the OPEC meetings. Kuwait ignores the communique, at which point Iraq notices something unusual. So there are oil fields that are on both sides of the border. And, you know, fluids, when you, if, if you have a border and you pull a fluid down on one side of the border, it doesn't pull, it, it pulls the other side down at the same rate because the fluid will just fill in the spaces. So if I'm pumping oil out in Kuwait, at a really fast rate, it's gonna bring down the oil on the Iraq side. So the, what those two states had done was they had made a deal about how much each side could pump out per year, that way the oil field would be shared. And what Iraq noticed was that the oil fields, on the, the shared oil fields, the, the levels were plunging, which meant that the Kuwaitis were pumping them out really fast. Um, and of course, then turning around and flooding the markets, literally with Iraqi oil. So the Iraqis then send a communique to Kuwait going, hey, you got to stop. You're stealing our oil and then flooding the markets, crashing the price of oil. That's affecting our economy. And Kuwait ignored that communique. Iraq issues another one going, this is an act of war. You, you, you need to stop now. And... Iraq then calls in the UN and says, we want an official neutral observer to inspect the oil fields and tell us what you find. The UN not only finds that Kuwait is in fact stealing from the joint oil fields, the UN discovered that there were Kuwaiti oil rigs on the Kuwait side of the border from Iraqi oil fields that were entirely inside Iraq. That these were not joint oil fields. So the UN inspectors tried to figure out what the heck are these Kuwaiti oil rigs doing in a place where there's no known oil field. And what they discovered was that the Kuwaitis were actually slant dr drilling under the border into these Iraqi oil fields and pumping that oil out too. So not only did the UN find that they were in fact in violation of the treaty on the joint oil fields, that they were actually stealing from fields that were entirely inside Iraq. So the Iraq rigs were not... So, so the rigs were not... In Iraq, they were in Kuwait, but they were slant drilling and they were stealing Iraqi oil. Yeah, they're going right underneath the border into Iraq. It's like, um, you ever see the movie, There Will Be Blood? Yeah. 
you ever see the end of it where where uh, Daniel Day Lewis is like, if my milkshake, if my <laughs> straw goes into your milkshake, then I take your, I drink your milkshake. <laughs> yeah, that was a good invitation, by the way. I really, I really felt like you were channeling Daniel Day Lewis there. I, I can only do it in moments. It's too much <laughs> of a brilliant actor. The channel, the channel in uh, more than five seconds. But it's so, it's so weird. Uh, that's that. That story is oddly left off. It's it left is left out of the of the propagandized storybook version of a desert storm. It definitely is. Um, and then to make it more complicated, Iraq uses the UN findings to, to tell Kuwait one more time to back down, and Kuwait again simply refuses to communicate with Iraq. They just don't reply. So Saddam Hussein brings in Ambassador April Glasby, the U.S. ambassador to Iraq. He sits her down. Um, I, I saw the film footage of this. It's super grainy. It's really hard to hear what they're saying. It's really low quality. Um, but I know that you can find the transcripts for their, for their conversation. And basically Saddam Hussein says, Kuwait is stealing our oil and then flooding the markets. We consider this to be uh, a hostile act. April Glasby says, the United States believes Kuwait is in the wrong on this and sides with Iraq on this matter. Saddam Hussein then, Saddam Hussein goes, the United States is a great ally of, the, of Iraq, a great ally of the Iraqi people. We really need your support in anything we do. Um, we're going to have to do something to Kuwait to get them to stop stealing our oil. At which point April Glasby says, anything that happens between Arab states is of no concern to the United States. Saddam Hussein rightly interprets that as a green light. But what's remarkable about that is that it's, it's a reversal of the Eisenhower doctrine, which was to not let the Arabs do whatever they wanted to amongst themselves. And so, you know, here we are, it's 1990, and uh, George Bush Sr. is abandoning the Eisenhower Doctrine, effectively, at least as in regards to Kuwait. Um, I remember when this was unfolding, I actually turned, this is be before anything happened, I turned to a friend of mine, I said, Iraq is gonna invade Kuwait in the next few days. And she said, you're an idiot. Like, how do you know that? You're just making stuff up. It was July. And then of course, a few days later, Iraq invaded Kuwait. And the, the thought that was going through my head was because Saddam Hussein got permission from the United States, that, that nothing would happen after that, that this was a done deal. Like this was just a 24 hour invasion. It took 24 hours because that's how long it took for the Kuwaiti military to run to Saudi Arabia. Um, the, you know, almost nobody died, almost no property was destroyed in the process. This was just a shockingly peaceful event. Kuwait had been carved out of the Basra province of the Ottoman Empire. Iraq was the Mo Mosul province, the Baghdad province, and the Basra province merged. So really, Kuwait was a part of Iraq. Like, the, the, you know, we're talking about Arabs and Arabs. It wasn't like there was an ethnic distinction between the two countries. There was no reason I, in, in that moment, in my mind, for anything to happen afterwards. It would resolve the oil the oil being flooded into the markets problem. The United States didn't rely on Iraqi and Kuwaiti oil. Uh, uh, the oil that we imported at the, in 1990 of it, 5% came from Iraq and Kuwait combined. Saddam Hussein made it very clear he wasn't going to interrupt the flow of oil. Uh, Saddam Hussein, on top of it all, told all Kuwaitis they were instantly citizens of Iraq. He made Kuwait the 19th province of Iraq. Um, he, he left all the business leaders in, in, in Kuwait in charge. He didn't plunder the country. He didn't turn things over to his friends. Um, he told all the Arabs living in Kuwait that they, were, that they could, if they wanted to, apply for, for Iraqi citizenship. So Kuwait was two-thirds foreigner, one-third Kuwaiti. And of the two-thirds foreigner, the majority were Egyptians, Palestinians, and Yemenis. Um, and then there was huge populations of Pakistanis and Indians and Filipinos and, and, and Iranians. Um, 
and he told all the Arabs that they would instantly have citizenship if they wanted it, and he told all the non-Arabs that they could go through a citizenship process. Well, that was an amazing upgrade in as far as human rights were concerned, because up until that point, those two-thirds that were living in Kuwait that weren't Kuwaitis had no pathway to citizenship. And, you know, it is an, a fundamental, essential human right that if you live in a place, you have some pathway to citizenship. Because uh, even if you can't benefit much from it because you're sort of a second-class citizen, at least your children will, will, will be born citizens. And, you know, that just didn't exist. Only a, a really brutal authoritarian state would do that to a whole chunk of its population. On top of it all... Um, Kuwait had actually dissolved its parliament in 1986. So the fact that Iraq had a parliament and had a parliamentary system was an upgrade for even the Kuwaitis because now, at least as a province of Iraq, they would have some say in the day-to-day the -day go goings-on of their country. It wouldn't be under a, an absolute monarchy. And then, of course, when it came to women's rights, Iraq was light years ahead of Kuwait. So this was a dramatic upgrade for women's rights in Kuwait. So, you know, like looking at it, from the outside looking in, it looked like the world became a slightly better place. Not that Saddam Hussein wasn't a tyrant, not that Saddam Hussein didn't put you in prison for political reasons. Obviously, that was happening. It's just compared to Kuwait, <laughs> that was not a, a bad outcome. And apparently, George Bush Sr. initially agreed with me. He got up in front of the world the day that Saddam Hussein launched his army into Kuwait and announced that he didn't see any problem with it. And so, there, so when Desert Shield happened, there was this moment of, wow, why? What the heck just happened? He asked for permission, you gave it, and now you're taking the permission away. And it was the, it's the emir of Kuwait, right? So it was a king. It was a monarchy, right? So technically, uh, emir means prince. Um, uh, was it an emirate? I don't even remember. Yeah, because I, I, I think it's, it's changed now. I could be wrong about that, but I think it's upgraded now to a monarchy, to a kingdom, to a kingdom. Okay. Um, I, the Sabah family has never interested me much, so I don't really pay attention to their, their politics, other than in 1986, uh, them getting rid of the parliament. I think that's really amazing. So, so what happened with U.S. foreign policy? What, what changed? So this is a mystery because, you know, like when you look at it from the outside, here's the stable loyal ally Iraq. They, so loyal, so, so careful, it asks for permission before it invades a breakaway territory of its, right? You know, that's, a, that's pretty polite. Um, and you have this really strong, decades-old relationship with this state. Why would you be willing to throw that away? So one of the things that happens, the sequence of events, and, and I'm looking at the sequence of events because I'm looking for clues. Margaret Thatcher jumps on an airplane after George Bush Sr. says, as far as I can tell, there's nothing wrong here. And they, they meet in Aspen, Colorado for two days. George Bush Sr. comes out, this is like three or four days after Iraq has invaded Kuwait, and he says, he's a Hitler. He's a Hitler, a thousand points of light. It was actually technically a different speech, but I don't know, it just felt like throwing that in there. He's, he keeps saying he's a Hitler, and we have to stop Saddam Hussein. He's a menace to the Middle East. So the first thing that comes to my mind is Iraq didn't attack us. Iraq didn't threaten to attack us. Iraq didn't have the means to attack us. So there's no reason to go after Iraq for our own personal security. Iraq got permission to invade Kuwait, so that, that's, it's not like he, he went rogue on us. Kuwait was a part of Iraq, so it's not like Iraq is being imperialist. It's simply correcting a British error from 80 years earlier. Sorry, from 90 years earlier. Um, it's, he's not sadistic or cruel to the Kuwaiti population, so this isn't a human rights problem. <laughs> he's actually improved human rights in, in Kuwait. So, you know, like if you go down the list, we don't get much of our oil from Iraq and Kuwait combined, 5%. So it's not like this is a catastrophic blow to our oil supply. But he didn't interrupt the flow, so there is no threat to our oil supply. If you, so when you go down the list, you're left with this 
there is no reason on earth for the United States to do this. So then I'm stuck going, okay, so what's Margaret Thatcher's thing? What was she thinking? And then who else is clamoring for the U.S. to do this? So the Brits were doing that. Who else? And the, the who else was the Saudis. The Saudis were screaming at the top of their lungs, you've got to stop this. You've got to reverse this. This is not acceptable. We will pay you billions of dollars. We will pay for your war effort if you, if you go in and restore Kuwait and get Saddam Hussein out. And so, so now, what's the catch with Saudi Arabia? Well, we have this old relationship with Saudi Arabia, old, decades old, but you know, we're only 230 years old, so decades is a long time for us, um, that we're keen to keep going. So it was kind of hard for us to ignore Saudi Arabia. What must have happened was George Bush Sr. must not have asked Saudi Arabia if they were okay with Iraq invading Kuwait. George Bush Sr. must not have asked Britain if Britain was okay with Iraq undoing Britain's creation of Kuwait. So, you know, right, what must have happened was Sr. had just dropped the ball talking to the people he wanted to make happy. Um, and then, of course, there's the Israel factor. Israel also was clamoring for the United States to intervene uh, on Kuwait's side. So, you know, clearly Bush didn't consult with Israel either. Um, so I think what you have to look at George Bush's next set of actions is as an external thing, that we were now acting on behalf of other people's interests, except for this. And, it, and it's, the, it's a piece that I think is super critical here. As Saudi Arabia is clamoring for us to intervene, we go back and we renegotiate. Because our, our relationship with Saudi Arabia, even though it was important and we have, you know, were keen to take care of it, it had decayed a lot. And the decay had happened because of our blind support for Israel. Um, the, the low point in U.S.-Saudi relations happened in 1973. And what had happened was, in the buildup to the 73 war, Egypt had actually gone to the Saudis and asked Saudi Arabia for one month of its oil revenues so that it could finish buying equipment for its military. And Saudi Arabia was not about to arm Egypt. <laughs> the Saudis were terrorized of Egypt because if Egypt ever became a superpower on the scale that it dreamt of, where it was going to unify the Arabs, Saudi Arabia was one of the places it was going to conquer. And the Saudis know this. And so the Saudis actually really liked Israel existing, and the Saudis actually really liked Israel being a thorn in Egypt's side because it meant Egypt would not be able to go after it. And so the Saudis are caught kind of in this weird situation where they need to show that they are allied with Egypt, that they're doing something to help Egypt without actually helping Egypt, without actually being allied with Egypt. Um, especially because the Saudis had actually fought Egypt in a proxy war in Yemen in the 60s. Um, Egypt in the 60s was in Yemen. It was Egypt had a Vietnam. It was the, the, the Yemen civil war in the 60s. And um, Israel, Great Britain, the United States, and Saudi Arabia backed the monarchists, and Egypt backed the guys who were fighting for democracy and socialism. And um, one of the reasons why Egypt was so badly punked in 1967 was the bulk of its military assets were in Yemen when Israel attacked. So now Egypt is recovering from the, that war. It withdrew from Yemen in 68. It's trying to go get the Sinai back from Israel because Israel grabbed the Sinai in 67. Saudi Arabia doesn't want to give it any money. So instead, it's, it, it's brainstorming, trying to figure out what else it can do. Executives from Exxon, who owned 30% of Aramco, the Saudi oil company, talked the Saudis into cutting off the U.S.'s oil exports, exports of oil to the U.S. And the reason is, is because Exxon thinks it'd be great symbolic gesture because it'll look like the Saudis are punishing the United States for supporting Israel. And then, the, but 
the real benefit is it's going to cause the price of oil in the world to spike. Exxon's going to make crazy money. Aramco is going to make crazy money. Saudi Arabia is going to make crazy money. Having said that, the Saudis have another problem, and that is that there's U.S. air base in, in Zahran, where the oil fields are, and the Saudis need to throw the U.S. out to show this, their level of disgust. So it's all theater, right? The Saudis don't actually believe any of this. They don't care. They don't care about the Palestinians. They don't care about Egypt. Um, they're just pretending to because their population, the public does. The monarchy does it. So they throw the United States out of the air base in Zahran. They, uh, and then they cut off the United States' oil supply. Price of oil goes through the roof. You know, we have gas lines everywhere. Everybody hates Saudi Arabia's guts now as a result. So when the Saudis ask Kuwait, ask for the United States to save Kuwait or to restore Kuwait, we come back with a list of demands. And it's not just of, of Saudi Arabia. We're making demands of Oman, Qatar, Bahrain, UAE. Like we put it all on the table. And one of the things we want is a permanent military presence in the Persian Gulf. We tell the Saudis they have to let us back into the Haran. We tell uh, Bahrain and Qatar we want permanent military bases there. Um, you know, we, we stack it on. And they agree. They comply. So one motive for us to do the war against Iraq is it'll allow us to have a permanent military presence in the Persian Gulf. Um, it'll be an intimidation factor for Iran, but it'll also make it so that we can do this. The number one supplier of oil to the United States is Canada. Number two is Mexico. Number, th number four is Venezuela. Number three is Saudi Arabia. Well, that's scary, having Saudi's oil interrupted. We saw the effect in 73 on gas prices. In 79, we saw the effect of losing Iran's oil, oil uh, exports. So we know that we need to protect our oil interests in Saudi Arabia. But we also know how to weather that kind of oil shock. We've done it twice. So this isn't something that we don't know what to do with. If we're in the Persian Gulf, Europe, India, and China get their oil from Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, and so if and and Iran and Iraq, if we're there and we want to hurt Europe, India, or China because one of them gets out of line, we can shut off their oil supply, and I think that that is a primary driving reason why. I think that's what Margaret Thatcher tells Bush is don't you want to be sitting on top of the whole rest of the world's oil supply? Um, so I think that's a driving factor. Obviously, we're going to also make crazy money for Raytheon and General Dynamics and Lockheed Martin because we're going to spend billions of dollars in military equipment, and then we're going to have to replace all of that. And so, you know, I, I have a feeling that there are a bunch of business guys, a bunch of rich, you know, it's a Republican Party. Bush was a Republican that faction of, of the guys who were heavily invested in the military industry coming to them and going, this would be great for our bottom line. Um, and so we do it. We do, a, we do this war against Iraq. That's really interesting. That's a really interesting point. It was kind of funny. I was talking to um, Dr. Uh, Gregory Goss, who, who was, a, I guess he's a Saudi expert. He concentrates a lot on Saudi Arabia. And I was interviewing him and I asked him, I was asking him about, about Mohammed bin Salman. And um, I asked him if the war in Yemen is a testament to the Saudis overreaching, like overreaching their power. Um, and he said, yeah, um, he, he thinks that MBS overestimates his power because he never had, he never lived through Nasser. He never lived through uh, Desert Storm. So he doesn't have like an, he's never lived through a point where Saudi Arabia was under some type of external threat. So I yeah. thought that was a really interesting point that he that, that he made. But this is also a really, I never thought of it. I never thought that. So you think Thor, uh, Thatcher convinced Bush of all that, like that he would be able, to, the U.S. would be able to control, um, I guess, European oil supply? I, I think so. And, I, I, and one of the reasons why I think that's the case is because that's one of the reasons why the British wanted Kuwait. Um, they knew 
if they couldn't secure the, the oil in the Middle East, like the oil that they found in Khuzestan, if there was oil found somewhere else, they would at least be able to cut off its shipping by, by having Kuwait as a military base. That, you know, so it was in the British mindset that Kuwait served that purpose. Um, and it helps explain why we would be so interested in somebody else's oil. You know, like, it wasn't, the, our oil just simply wasn't being threatened. There was no external threat to any of our interests, um, especially because there's a test for this. When we, when we announced Desert Shield, if, if you were Saddam Hussein and you wanted, and you really sincerely thought the United States was going to attack, and that no matter what you did, you were going to lose, and you might even lose your life, and you might, even, you might be overthrown, right? And what you would have done is you would have waited until we had gotten about half the 82nd Airborne on the ground in Saudi Arabia, and then you would have attacked. Because it would, the Saudis had no chance of withstanding the Iraqi military. The Saudis were a speed bump to Iraq. Half the 82nd Airborne would have been an insufficient amount of our military personnel to also prevent the Iraqis, but enough people that it would have inflicted the kind of losses that Americans don't like to see in war. And so you, would have, you wouldn't have waited until the United States, because the United States took four months to fully deploy you wouldn't have waited four months to let your enemy fully deploy. You would have attacked them early on, maybe one month in. And then, and then, you know, like if you look at how fast the Iraqi military probably could have traveled before the United States would have had a real serious chance of reacting, Iraq would have easily grabbed the entire eastern coast of Saudi Arabia. Well, that's where all the oil fields are. So that at that point, he could literally tell the world, I will blow up every single rig if you don't back down. We would have probably brought in B-52s and began carpet bombing them, and we would have used everything we had on an aircraft carrier to stop him. He, he would have still gotten that entire section of Saudi Arabia. There was nothing on the ground that could have stopped that. So interestingly enough, he doesn't do that. And that also makes me wonder, like, why does, why is he sitting there just looking at the United States, watching us deploy, when he knew he had the military might to hum humiliate us, inflict serious casualties on us, and interrupt the world's oil supply? And he chose not to do that. It's almost as if uh, there was an unspoken understanding that he had with George Bush Sr., it's almost as if he knew he was a pawn and he was going to play the game and he was going to play by the rules. Um, and I, and I, maybe he was naive too in the process because I don't think we were playing by rules. <laughs> I can just imagine him. I imagine him thinking like, okay, I get it. I'll just, I know where you're going at. Wink, wink. Yeah, exactly. I could totally see him doing that. And then, and then he discovers there was no winking. <laughs> yeah, he discovered that when he was waiting to be executed. Exactly. Like, Wait, what? Ugh. What about when Rumsfeld hugged me? I shouldn't have trusted Bush. Yeah. Go figure. So, U.S., they pound Iraq in, I mean, it, 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 a couple of weeks, right? How long does that take to thwart Iraq out of Kuwait? Uh, so I think it's four week air war. Um, and then it takes about four or five days to drive Iraq out of Kuwait. So I want to talk about the sanctions real quick because the sanctions were just so inexplic they, they, they're it's, it's a great tragedy that goes untalked in human history. The, the, the sanctions on Iraq. Um, I think you and estimate, I, I'm not sure what the exact number is, but I know on the low side is like 500,000 people died on the higher. I, I tend to believe the high side that are, that are over a million people that die because the sanctions lasted 12 years, right? That's correct. Uh, so why did you, why did the United States put such brutal sanctions on Iraq after the war? Okay, that is a fantastic question because from like a geopolitical standpoint, from a strategic standpoint, it makes zero sense. Um, so George Bush Sr. gets up in front of the world after the war and says, you know, we've, we've liberated Kuwait. Yay, now they can go back to a brutal tyranny. Um, it's just so outrageous. It's bizarre. Um, 
So he liberates Kuwait. He then announces Iraq can rejoin the community of nations, whatever the hell that means, um, as soon as it gets rid of its weapons of mass destruction. So in August of 1991, uh, Saddam Hussein ordered all his chemical weapons, which just for the record are not weapons of mass destruction, but that is, that is part of the propaganda, right? They've been elevated. Um, he orders that all his chemical weapons be destroyed. And the Iraqi military takes all these chemical weapons out in the desert and blow them up in August of 1991. Well, to show that we were tough, we imposed these brutal sanctions on Iraq where we were going to cut off their food and cut off their medicine and all this tech that was supposed to go in to modernize Iraq. We cut it all off with the understanding that um, there will be pressure from the Iraqi population to overthrow Saddam Hussein. Because you have to remember, we do something really bizarre, uh, another inexplicable thing. When we do the four-week bombing campaign, we're not just bombing military targets. We're blowing up all the bridges. We blow up the schools. We blow up the milk the formula, the baby formula factories. We blow up their pharmaceutical factories. We're, we're, we blow up their police stations. We bomb their um, bomb shelters that they were using to, to hide civilians we, we sent bunker buster bombs to kill civilians. Like, this was clearly a war where we decided we were gonna hurt the Iraqi civilian population. Then we do this four day campaign, five day campaign. We get, we get to Basra and we pull out. We don't, we don't stay, we don't overthrow Saddam Hussein. We don't capture Basra, we just get there and pull out. Um, we liberate, liberate in air quotes because it's absurd. Kuwait, we bombed the hell out of Kuwait, by the way, Kuwait City, um, for no reason. The Iraqis were fleeing. We, we massacre thousands of Iraqi soldiers who are fleeing on the roads. We just hit them with incendiary bombs and burn them alive. You know, we do all this, and then we tell, we tell the Shia in the south and the Kurds in the north, if you rise up against Saddam Hussein, we'll support you. Those populations rise up. We withdraw and send them no support. And so the next thing you know, Saddam Hussein is caught, right? What is he going to do? Is he, he's going to let the Kurds and the Shia rebel against him? He has to put those rebellions down. It's just an act of survival. He slaughters a bunch of Kurds and Shia to put down these rebellions that we started. And then we impose these sanctions. But there's a, there's a weird twist in all of this. And it's the way George Bush says this. He says, as soon as Iraq gets rid of its chemical weapons, he calls them weapons of mass destruction incorrectly, Iraq will be allowed to come back into the community of nations. Well, I think Saddam Hussein understood this as, go blow up your weapons and we'll let you back in. That was the formula. The sanctions will end as soon as you blow up the weapons. So he sends the weapons into the desert in August and blows them up. Because this guy, this poor guy, dumbass, thinks that there are rules and if he just follows the rules the united states will treat him correctly um anyway we send in the weapons inspection regime in 1992 uh scott ritter is going to end up in charge he was a, a colonel in the united states marine corps originally and he's there on the ground looking for these weapons of mass destruction that have been blown up but the twist is george bush senior loses an election everybody thought he was guaranteed to win to bill clinton and bill clinton has a different plan he's a different president he doesn't have he didn't know maybe even what the plan was his goal isn't to integrate iraq back into the community of nations he needs iraq because it's a great way to distract the public you know when when something goes wrong he drops he bombs iraq when something goes wrong he starts talking nasty about saddam hussein like Iraq becomes the perfect scapegoat distraction for the American public. Um, the UN weapons inspection regime realizes that the Iraqis have blown up all their weapons. The problem is, is they, they were sent to record the serial numbers for all the rockets that had the sarin gas and the VX gas and the mustard gas and the ner other nerve agents. And so what ends up happening is, uh, 
Scott Ritter is going into the desert and they've got sifters and they're trying to sift where the, the rockets were blown up looking for the serial numbers to record the numbers. They're not actually picking up rockets that are filled with gas. They're just looking for these serial numbers. It's a bureaucratic roundup as opposed to an actual meaningful thing. Bill Clinton could have at any moment ended the sanctions against Iraq. The UN number on the number of Iraqis killed under Bill Clinton's eight years is 800,000 people. The UN estimates that of the 800,000, 500,000 were age five and under. So in effect, what we did for eight years was murder half a million babies. Um, and, and again, it's for no reason, right? There's, what did Iraq do to deserve this? What did the Iraqi people do to deserve this? Even if Saddam Hussein was a bad guy, and he was certainly because he was putting people in prison for political reasons, he was executing political prisoners. There's, you know, there's nobody probably on earth who def runs around defending Saddam Hussein. Why do we have to kill 800,000 Iraqis? How does that equate? They're the victims, and what are we doing? We're victimizing the victims. Uh, and then, of course, the sanctions continue, really, for almost another four years after uh, Clinton under George Bush Jr.'s administration. I've never seen numbers on the last four years, but you have to assume it's probably around 100,000 a year. What's so, what's, what is so confusing to me is that, I guess, sanctions in theory, they're enforced to make the living conditions so bad that the civilian population will rise up and overthrow their government. But it seemed like that Bill Clinton, he needed, a, a, he needed Saddam Hussein. He needed that scapegoat, like you said, to, to use yeah, whenever so. he had a scandal. Right. I, I think... You know, I think the average person looking at the sanctions go, that's there to, to force the Iraqi people to overthrow the government. There's a problem, though, and it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If I don't have food in my belly, I'm not, I don't give a crap what my government is. My primary goal is to get food in my belly. All I'm thinking about is where am I going to get my next meal from? If I have starving children, I'm not even concerned about where I'm going to get my next meal from. I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to get their next meal. I'll go without a meal. I'm not thinking, wow, I'd run, love to run over there and shoot that guy and get him out of power. And so it, it's actually a completely insane belief that people hold that somehow a sanction is going to result in the overthrow of the government. The, it comes from what we did with apartheid. What we did with apartheid South Africa is we cut off trade with them, but we didn't cut off their food supply. We didn't cut off their medicine supply. What we did was we made it so that it was difficult for businesses to do business in South Africa so that they got hit in the pocketbook. And of course, what that did was that made the, the Afrikaner white population go, okay, fine, surely there's a way. We can still be, keep making money off the gold and the diamonds in South Africa and the vanadium and everything else that we're mining out of the ground here. Um, we don't need to be in charge of the government. We'll turn it over to a, demo a democracy with air quotes and go from there. Nobody was starving to death in the process. Well, there probably were people starving, but they were, but they were, uh, they were gonna be starving anyway because you know, it was apartheid South Africa. In the case of Iraq, we don't impose just business sanctions. We cut their food off. It's a whole different level. It's a level of brutality that really is literally a, an act of war. I mean, starving a whole population to death is not, is not just economic sanction. That is, that's a level above that. It's a war crime. I mean, how's that different than what Hitler did? Um, I, you know, 800,000 people for what? What was gained? And the crazy thing is, is Madeleine Albright was actually asked after the Clinton administration ended in an interview, what did you think of this? Look at these UN numbers, 500,000 babies. And she says, I would do it all over again. Yeah, and wasn't that played over and over again on like Arab television news? Yeah. <laughs> it's remarkable. Like how, what kind of sadistic person says that? What she should have said if she was a human being was, oh my God, it didn't result in the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. It was a mistake on my part. I we should have come up with a better policy. 
um, you know, Janet Reno, just to keep it in that, in that administration, she, you know, she, she gets, uh, she becomes attorney general. The next thing you know, Waco is happening and David Koresh and his people are dead. And, you know, we're talking children dead in the process. And when Janet Reno was asked how she felt about that, she said, I made mistakes. That was not a good outcome. I, I, there is not a day where I don't feel bad about what happened there. That's a human being, a person who kills 800,000 people and then says, yeah, I do it all over again. That's, that's remarkable. That, that's a lack of humanity. Um, so yeah, I just, it's, to me, it's inexplicable. And, and the sanction, the Iraq, the Iraqi sanctions, the, uh, the Christian soldiers in Saudi Arabia and the U S support for Israel, Weren't those the three reasons why bin Laden at least said he did 9-11? So, yeah, I mean, he, he, he uses excuses like U.S. support for Israel, that there are non-Muslims in Saudi Arabia. Um, I, I honestly think his number one reason was that even though he hated Saddam Hussein, right, he had, he had actually put a hit on Saddam Hussein, he couldn't believe that we had inflicted the kind of punishment we had on Iraq. I, I really think his, his real motive was an act of vengeance. Um, because by the time 9-11 happened, we, we had probably killed about a million Iraqis. Um, and I think in his damaged mind, because he clearly wasn't a very, uh, very sane person by this point, somebody had to avenge that million Iraqis. And it was him. He was the one who was going to do it. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously no excuse for terrorism, but it's interesting to point out that we probably killed about 3 million Iraqis over the course of the first war, probably around 100,000 Iraqis. The sanctions was probably about a million people. And then the second war, Johns Hopkins estimates that the number is somewhere between 1.2 to 2 million people. Um, so, you know, we're talking probably in the neighborhood of 3 million people. If you use the number 3 million over the 21 years that we, that we did the, first, the two wars and the sanctions, um, that works out to a 9-11 every 10 days. We inflicted 3,000 fatalities every 10 days for 21 years on a country that never attacked us. Uh, you know, it's... It's just, it's baffling. It's really baffling. And it's crazy that we haven't even talked about the Bush Jr. invasion of Iraq yet. We haven't. <laughs> and, and the death toll and the death toll is already in the millions. Right. Yeah. By the time Bush Jr. attacks, it's the, the low number is probably a million. The high number is probably like 1.3. Um, so... The, the Bush attack, it makes even less sense than his dad's attack. Um, you know, at least in his dad's attack, you can find some strategic reason. Like you can say, okay, we wanted to be on top of the oil. We wanted to have permanent bases in, in Qatar and Bahrain. Uh, you know, we wanted, to, we wanted to make our presence felt. The Saudis were going to pay us for the war. The, the second war, we keep inflate, conflating Saddam Hussein and... and um, Osama bin Laden. In fact, if you look at the transcripts from the Bush administration throughout 2002, every time they said Osama bin Laden, they made sure to then say, and Saddam Hussein. So Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. Because they knew that the American public knew nothing, because right, the American public is not very well educated, and that they would, they would, they would be easy to manipulate. Um, what, what happened in 1998 was Bill Clinton had decided he wanted to distract the country again. Um, he's got a scandal unfolding on him. He fires uh, cruise missiles into Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia. But then he decides it would be really nice to bomb Iraq also. And uh, he orders Scott Ritter and the UN inspectors out of Iraq so that he can bomb Iraq. And Scott Ritter begged Clinton not to do it. He said, look, I, I've, I've identified 98% of the gas canisters. Uh, we, and the reason we knew the serial numbers is because we sold them to Iraq. We, we had the, our, our copy of the receipt. And he, he said, we are at 
98% Mr. President, let me finish. Let me get to, let me get that last 2% so that we can end the sanctions against Iraq. And Clinton said, get out. So Scott Ritter left under protest. He bombs Iraq. Saddam Hussein at that point had figured out no matter what he did, no matter how many rules he followed, he was never ever coming back into the community of nations. Um, you know, it took him eight years to figure it out, but he figured it out. So after the bombing happened, Clinton then said, we want to send the inspectors back in. Saddam Hussein said, forget about it. I know no matter what I do, you're never going to let me reintegrate Iraq back into the world. I figured that out. I'm done with you. You can go to hell. So Junior in 2002 says he's going to go to war with Iraq. And, you know, he's catching a lot of flack because he says, I don't even need approval from Congress. I definitely don't need uh, UN approval. I'm going to do this. I'm the decider. And, you know, our allies are protesting. Our allies are freaking out. Germany is, uh, Gerhard Schroeder is telling us, you can't do this. We did this. It's called Poland 1939. You can't just randomly attack countries. You're setting a bad precedent for the world. Well, you know, what, you do this now. Maybe Russia is going to do something like this in the future. You can't, we need you to be the moral high ground so that when somebody misbehaves, whether it's Russia or China or whomever, in the future, we can point to how, how countries are supposed to behave Junior doesn't care. So what Junior does is he says he's got weapons of mass destruction. He's trying, to, he's trying to enrich uranium to make nuclear bombs. He's planning to bomb America. He's planning to attack us. Uh, enough international pressure is put on the United States that Junior has to accept another round of UN inspectors. And Saddam Hussein realizes Junior is going to do this war, so he agrees. Saddam Hussein allows Hans Blix to come in and do a second round of inspections. Junior doesn't allow the inspections to take full effect. He doesn't allow Hans Blix to go to the last places that Scott Ritter needed to go to because he knows there's nothing to find. <laughs> he knows this whole thing is total BS. And, uh, you know, Valerie Blame is outed from the CIA while she's in the field. Uh, Dick Cheney's office actually releases her name as an act of vengeance because her husband was one of the guys who was supposed to track down the uranium enrichment program. And he, come back, he comes back and he says, there is no uranium enrichment program. And that's why that whole thing unfolded, right? Uh, Junior knew there was nothing there, or at least Dick Cheney did. I don't know what Junior knew. And so he has to figure out a way to, to do the war anyway. Interestingly enough, Dick Cheney plays a major role. Dick Cheney would have his office, the, white, the his vice presidential office, leak information to the New York Times uh, that there was categorical evidence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And then the next day, when a uh, journalist would ask Dick Cheney, how did he know there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? He would say, I read it in the New York Times yesterday. And he did this little circular thing. Um, eventually, of course, George Bush Jr. throws Hans Blix and the UN weapons inspectors out without giving them about a few months to, to start this inspection program and then attacks. Uh, again, it's inexplicable. The Iraq never attacked us. Iraq didn't have the means to attack us. Uh, Iraq posed no threat to any of its neighbors because we had literally starved it to death for 12 years. Um, and then we, inf but this time we, we disassemble the state. We literally get rid of Iraq and we leave the place without any state apparatus, which means no police, no military. There is no social welfare system. There's no food distribution network. And, and then and we're militarily occupying it. And so for the first few months, Iraqis don't fully get what has just happened to them. So there's a little bit of calm. And then the next thing you know, by 2004, we're in past our eyeballs in this nightmarish, hellish event that we manufactured. There was no need for any of it. You know, it's really funny. Dick Cheney, I think, I don't remember when the interview was, but he was being interviewed about invading Iraq. And he's like, no, absolutely, the U.S. shouldn't invade Iraq. You have the Sunnis and you have the Shiites and the Kurds and it's going to be a civil war. It's just going to be a big, a whole big mess. 
And all of a sudden, he changed his mind. He changed yeah. his mind. Yeah. And everything that he predicted in that in that interview came true. He ended up in power. I mean, the U.S. empowered Iran at the end of the day. Our worst fear, our worst Absolutely. fear in the U.S. society is empowering Iran. It's what you see every single time you watch MSNBC or CNN. Like, oh, this person's been powering Iran. Tulsi Gabbard is, is, is you know, cozying it up with Iran. It's like a form of McCarthyism. It really meanwhile, is. We, we support, meanwhile... We empowered Iran by invading Iraq. Right. It's just, the, it's just the most hilarious, ironic thing at the end of it. And, and, and nobody can explain why we hate Iran so much. They, well, did, they didn't overthrow our democracy. <laughs> um, yeah, nobody can. Scott Horton, who he's, not, he's also located in Austin, Texas. He gave a really good explanation. He says that Iran is working, Iran is working on an, after the Soviet Union fell, um, Iran was working on enough missile technology. They were they had a big enough population where they and they had a mean old Ayatollah at the time where they could always have that Iranian threat to justify the military spending as well as you know our alliances in the U.S. our alliances our assets in the Middle East. Right, Iran became a convenient boogeyman. Yeah. Well, I think on that note, we we're at about an hour and fifty minutes, man. This is this is great, man. I love talking to you. You, you had you have uh, such a tremendous knowledge on the Middle East, but I was, you know, you, you have other lectures as well where you go over philosophy and government. I know you're, you're I guess you're you're a government teacher, right? You teach U.S. government, or yes. How did uh like the how did did you teach Middle Eastern courses as well or like history courses or is it all just combined into did you see the need of you know having a holistic view of everything to I guess the man to measure the cause and effects? Uh, yeah, so it's always been a passion of mine. Um, when I was working with the University of Maryland, I helped convert one of their courses into an online course that was a Middle East history course. Um, but, but, but I, yeah, I've never uh, actually gotten the opportunity to teach it just specifically a Middle East class. Um, my, my, uh, it's, but it's still my passion. So, but it's kind of good because, you know, you sh maybe your job shouldn't exactly be your hobby. <laughs> yeah. So it works out really well for me. I have a feeling that if I taught this uh, too much, it would it would wear me out. It's just so depressing. Yeah, it is very depressing. We talk we talk about the Middle East so much on this podcast now that it's like sometimes I just want to take a break from it all because it is it is very depressing. We we, we us taking a break on our podcast. My co-host who isn't who isn't here today, um, will will talk about like the history of like the U S Navy or something like that. <laughs> cool. <laughs> or, or, that's a nice break. or we'll talk about like world war one. Yeah. That's a nice perfect. Like that's something that's not depressing. Right. But I guess right. the, the chaos is so far away. It's, it's, it's longer where you can like, you can talk about it in a more objective manner. Like the new, you know, the, we're not seeing the cause and effects today of world war one. I. I mean, we obviously are, but it's, it's less personal. So it's further back in history. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you want to, you said you wanted to schedule part three of this <laughs> part, part three. It's yeah. Whenever, yeah, whenever, whenever, I mean, I would love to talk to you about any topic that you want to speak about. I know that you do, you do. Um, um, I watched one of your lectures on, on the Austin school um, on the rise of Islam. I think that's what it's labeled. Yeah. That was a really interesting one. Um, all, all the lectures, I give my hot, like everyone who hasn't checked out the, the Austin School YouTube page, it's, it's really great. Um, also, make sure you check out Roy's book. Um, and uh, the, uh, the Blood Throne of Caria, right? Remember yes, that? that's correct. The Blood Throne of Caria, which will be in the description below. Uh, and Roy, I mean, thank you so much for being on the show again, man. I, wanna ha I, I would love to have you on as soon as, you know, as soon as possible, as soon as you have some free time. Absolutely. Let's do it. Because we, 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 we basically stopped at 2003, so uh, we, we have part three still to do. Yeah, we have from 2003 to, to uh, I guess, the, the modern contemporary situation right now. 
Yeah. But yeah. Talk about Syria. Talk about, um, I mean, that would be a fun topic. I guess that would be, that's like the other hot, well, it's not, I guess it's the hottest thing right now, or it's been the hottest thing to talk about in the Middle East over the past five years, just because of like the brutality of ISIS. Yeah. That's how like they, but I mean, there's, there's, there's so much chaos. Uh, all right. I'll let Roy, I'm going to stop recording. Let's go.